or notice that there are better players than me in this game. So I do recognize that I also need to get lucky in this kind of, to get to the world championship, but it just happens sometimes that you do get lucky, but you also need to be up there with the skill level. But I, as a player, maybe like tuning the decks for a tournament, that would be my skill. Like usually for my friends and me, we are, it's not a real team, but kind of a team. So usually I just, we pick the deck together, but usually I do the tuning part. And usually it's Talian who does well in the tournaments and I don't, but at least for once it was a draft tournament. And I think he's like, out of us, he's the best drafter. So it was a bit funny that this time it was then I who, it was me who made the finals and in the end won the whole thing. So, yeah. And uh, how did you, how did you meet other players and do other, was it Discord, Reddit, any, anywhere like that? Well, most of my friends we know from like real life from magic like we've been friends for 10 15 years at least and uh, then some of the players like finnish is a language that you can recognize the words like if you are finnish at least so if i get to pair up pair up against someone in the game who i think is from finland i usually just add them as a friend and i found one really good player like this and I've been listening his advices like a lot of lot of the time, like what is a good deck right now, and he plays a lot too. So he's been doing not recently well, but quite well before in all the ranked formats. So so yeah, by luck also I meet people in the game. That's cool. All right. So at this point, I want to turn things over to you. And uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask uh, me about the game, what goes into making it, uh, anything along those lines, uh, I'll do my best to give you a good answer. Uh, I try to think like hard and even ask from my friends, do they have anything they want to want me to ask? And Nothing really came up, but I was just last night talking with a couple of friends about the draft in Eternal, and we were wondering, like, could it be possible to do in the draft tournament, the top 64 to be like a live draft so that it's not like the usual draft, but that you would have like pods of eight players or something that they would draft on live and then have the two and three packs go opposite direction so that you would have like a real signals that you could mm -hmm. read and send. Have you uh, thought about this or something? Hi, definitely. So uh, just for everybody watching, um, because they might not be familiar, um, uh, in Eternal, you are drafting what we call asynchronously, which means that you're drafting with other players, but not um, necessarily at really the same time that they're playing. So uh, the way that it works is each pack that you see and pass gets recorded by the game, and then it will be paired up. So that way uh, players in the future will get past the packs that you took a card out of, and we will try to pair it up so that players who um, were taking similar cards um, get paired up appropriately so that way if in the first pack you take a lot of fire and justice cards on the way back you'll be getting passed from somebody who didn't see a lot of fire and justice cards um during their draft and that's the way it goes for each of the packs of the draft and so what you're speaking to is this idea of what if we had the players doing it in real time so that way um i pass a pack to you and then on i'm passing to you in the first pack and then in packs two and three, you're passing to me um, the packs that you see. 
and it's something that we would like to be able to do potentially um it's uh the biggest uh cost is just uh the all of the the development time from an engineering and uh art and design perspective that we need to go into building that feature and so um it's not something that is in our eminent plans but uh you know we've got a lot of we've got a long list of things that we'd love that in our in our dream world we would get to bring to the game um and so that that's definitely one of them uh because it would be exciting to see uh the dynamic and one of the other things though that comes up with your question is um how much when we are trying to make our tournaments do we want them to be the most um skill testing as possible versus trying to match the experience that players are getting when they play in the normal day-to-day -day queues um you know we there's certainly compromises in some places playing a best of three match with open deck lists is fundamentally different than playing uh best of one with closed deck lists when you're just on the ladder but we do want to make it close enough we want to make sure it's close enough that it feels like your preparation can actually match the experience you get when you play in the tournaments. Yeah, I can understand that. And it was not really like a complaint. It was just like wondering if you could make it similar to how the draft is in Magic. Or oh, I don't know if I don't really play any other games. So, so I don't know about those, but it was just a question from someone who doesn't play Eternal. And that was his reasoning for not playing that he didn't like this asynchronous draft like it was one of his reasons that he quit eternal at some point oh uh, well, yeah um you know we we would love to be to be able to deliver all the different versions of ways to play as possible and uh yeah but we'll keep working at it Welcome back. It's semifinals time here at the Open, and we have, you know, just four players remaining. Exactly what you'd predict for a semifinal. And, uh, you know, we came through as always. Uh, at the top of the bracket, the match we'll be starting off with, we're going to be checking out the Burgund versus Gauzer. And uh, we've seen a little bit of uh, Gauzer just like a turn. They were playing an Argentport uh, deck earlier, an Argentport mid-range control deck. And We'll see. Maybe they got uh, enough tav rods and black books to get through it because they're going to be going up against the Burgund and uh, that Huru control deck looks to be slaying uh, this weekend. Uh, so far, it's just an extremely uh, smooth sailing last round and we'll see if they can do it again this round. Yeah, it looked incredible against Zenin and um, I would expect it to be similarly good against Argentport, but the, uh, the details matter and we'll go check it out. The bottom of the bracket, there is a uh, mirror match of two creation project decks, and we'll find out who's going to be going up against them from this side. And uh, Gauzer's, you know, not not an ideal seven, I would say, by any means, but they've got a Vine Grafter, they've got a couple of units, and so they can they're going to try to string some things together here. Argentport Silex. Yeah, it looks like that one might be staying on top. And we'll see Vine Grafter. And how, uh, how aggressively is Bergen going to be here? Okay, well, they didn't have the undepleted power. I was curious if we would see something like Display of Survival on the Vine Grafter. But the Vine Grafter is going to get to go off an ultimate here, meaning we're going to go into the market. We're going to be able to give a unit regen. We picked up Regent's Tomb and... Now we'll see what got buffed. It'll be Valkyrie Enforcer. Uh, nice thing about doing it on the Valkyrie Enforcer, gets another unit out of Hailstorm range. And uh, Regent's Tomb here, we saw Zen uh, Temple last match do basically nothing. Regent's Tomb, on the other hand, has actually got a little lift here. All three of the modes are situationally useful, and it's a lot more pressure coming off uh, if the agenda goes off as well. So Sabotage here is going to get stymied by Display of Survival. So draw a card and gain an Aegis. And now for the Burgund, 
They're going to get down a Genev Merchant. That'll let them go into the market. They found Helio. Look at that. There's a Tazbu on top of the My deck. Goodness. So uh feels like this is going decently well for Gauzer at the start. I mean, certainly better than what we saw Zedin put up. Like playing some cards that are useful, doing some things. A market improvement. Giving the Vine Grafter now revenge. The Argent Port Silex is still having a treasure trove. We even have five Shadow Influence, so we can warp Tazbu, get an attack for three. A lot of nice things, and now the Burgund can just play Helio and draw three, but they might only do some significant cleanup following that. There's Stormhall plating. Lingering Influence. Finding a Justice Sigil. Another Tazbo on top of the deck. Though I will say this is a pretty important point because if you utilize Slay that on the Helio, you can keep the Regent's Tomb around and get that revenge unit, that revenge Valkyrie. Um, but if, but you know, who wants to miss up on warp value? Um, I don't know. The tome's pretty important. It does. You know, at a certain point, you're playing against a deck with all these sweepers. Um, the extra cards, I think, are a somewhat dubious value because. Um, you're just going to get a lot swept away anyway or be discarding the hand cap or whatever. So so we see Tazbu. And so now by doing this, it means if they want, if the double block goes on to the Tazbu, you're going to get to draw uh, two cards from that. Instead, we're going to see a chump. So the Bergen's going to navigate it by chumping on the Tazbu, using Helio to finish off the site, and now maybe playing something like a harsh rule which would draw Gauzer a lot of cards, but it's it's unclear how much the cards matter versus like the board presence. Right. Or can you convert into anything that won't just be undone regardless? In fact, one of those cards is gonna get uh, hit by the hand cap. And they're not gonna get to draw for turn because of the hand cap. But with Speaking Circle, another Tazbu to warp and an exploit. There's some things in the work here. And if they need to discard a few cards to hand size, not the end of the world. There's probably some extra removal you can get rid of. Some slays. Probably. So exploit here. It could hit the Stormwall plating. You do have a Minotaur Lighthoof in hand, which would be able to hit that next turn. Orin Condemnation is always really, really annoying. Um, because it just gains so much, buy, it buys so much time. And it, it's a very hard card to play around, but you know, there's also Sky Craig Synthesis. So no shortage of options here. It's actually gonna be Wisdom of Elders. So Gauzer is really just hoping they can ride their cards um, and not have to worry about the fact that maybe something like an Orn Condemnation will happen. I really love that line from, from Gauzer. Because what that means is you, you go, you know that this is coming, Stormhall Plating, take some damage, your Tazbu's Boo's dead. But now you have a light hook to take care of the Relic, and their leftovers, the Bergen's leftovers, no sources of card advantage. No ways to gas up, so they're actually playing off the top of it. And it's also all stuff you don't have to play into. Synthesis, Condemnation, Defiance, there's a lot of different ways to play around that stuff. So, uh, Wisdom of the Elders might have seemed like the most innocuous card in the hand, but I think that was a really sharp play from Gauzer of, of, of targeting that with the exploit. And now they get to play Moldermuck here because they, they knew there wasn't a sweeper last turn, so this is definitely a line that, that lets them build out a board pretty quickly. We're going to see Boundless Knowledge get unleashed, and Bergen is going to uh, play the unleashed copy. So... They're not going to have any kind of defenses this turn. They're going to take another hit here. There's Fall of the Spire coming next turn. But there's a lot of things happening right now for Gauzer. You can even, I mean, are there any hits off of the Speaking Circle that are just lethal here? Um, Just lethal? That's a lot. You need seven extra damage. A three cost spell which delivers seven extra damage. I don't. Nothing's coming to mind immediately. 
Because, like, it is kind of a, a mopey <laughs> speaking circle. But also, you might not... Here's just... one that would actually get there, but it's really weird and unlikely to happen. If you go, like, draw a card, get a justice influence, and then play speaking circle and hit abundance and hit trick shot ruffian. Okay. <laughs> That's a line. It's a line you can play, too. Because um, nothing else in hand is really materially changing anything right now. What you could do, I guess, is use your um, your Archiport blueprints, I suppose, is fine. Yeah. Oh, importantly, but you would need to play the Speaking Circle before the Treasure Trove. Yes. Right. But then you wouldn't have the seventh Justice in Ports. Yeah. Oh, instead, we're going to just go for drawing two things with the Argentport blueprints. So. When you crack Archonport Blueprints, you get to draw two units from your Void, and they have Aegis and Endurance. Sets them up nicely for a long game, but I feel like this was a good opportunity for Gowser to push on things a little bit. Yeah, I was worried about that, that too. Of the, This is just kind of a, a really slow way to do it, and um, the door starting to close a little bit here. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, now these Tazboos are locked out. <sighs> they are locked out... But we're going to see Valkyrie Enforcer with regen. Treasure Trove. Wow, hitting the Vine Grafter with Destiny. And they can ultimate it here. Twisted Farmer's not a not a bad get either. No, that's going to be really good in a couple of turns. So we're going to see Vine Grafter ultimate. Hail Rider's timepiece. Dreaming big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the scary thing you got to watch out for if you're the Burgund is once you get to this stage of the game, you might get to a point where Burgund has the power to do something like play a Storm while Plating and a Sweeper in the same turn and kill you. Being a 12 is not ideal. It would be so nice if Gowser was one higher. So we're going to see Orin Condemnation hit the Valkyrie Enforcer down to a virtual 11, 9 health and 2 armor. So what's the sequencing look like now for Gowser? You could exploit, you could Speaking Circle, you could hold up Twisted Farmer. Could Tazbu? I mean, it, the, the tough spot for Gowser here is their best card is Twisted Farmer. But when you decide to go down that road, your hand's on the table, that's what you're doing. Because right. you're going to be pl passing with all your power up. Display of Survival is going to hit Exploit again. So still get to Plunder if you're Gazer. Oh, did they not? Oh, they did not? Plunder. So they're, they're, they like having all this action. So there's right. Tazbu. It does have um, Aegis, thanks to the Blueprints. And if Burgon wants to uh, wants to stop the other Tazbu from coming down, you could do this line of Hailstorm plus Follow the Spire. First pop the Aegis, then kill the Tazbu. There's another Molar Mountain. It, it's not clear if Gowser has a way to kind of uh, go uh, pump up the, the Sap Suckers if they go wide. We're not at the point yet where Twisted Farmer on its own would be lethal. And it feels like right now that Gowser, what they're kind of trying to do with the Twisted Farmer is make sure they have that as an insurance policy against the Storm Hall plating. Yeah, well, also, you know, try to play enough out of the hand to compel the Bergen to answer what's going on and then be able to create some pressure with the leftovers off the Twisted Farmer, too. But, yeah, it is a... It is a really strong insurance policy against Stormhall Plane being lethal. If you assume that if you get it to your turn, you'll, you're going to be able to answer it. And with a bunch of units and the speaking circle having a shot at blowing it up outright. All right, so we are going to see Twisted Farmer now. Bergen has picked up Stormhall Plating. The Twisted Farmer on the way, so we're going to see Defiance hit the actual Farmer and Defiance hit the Reappropriator. So this is going to take Bergen down to seven, but I'm not sure if Gowser scouted that Twisted Farmer and knew they had it coming, but that it's very nice that they have that one uh, in the reserves. 
It, it's kind of incredible that this speaking circle hasn't gotten into the mix at some point. Right. <laughs> I, you know, every turn, Gowser's certainly had a number of good options, and it just, I guess, just kind of turns out each one, each time it hasn't been speaking circle. So, Bergen is going to kind of, like, go for the win here. You play Stormhall Plating, and you attack twice, and it works. You win. A Twisted Farmer is going to come down, ambush it, and then a Hailstorm... is going to can wipe out the mandrakes allow the second attack to get through and then you have harsh rule presumably for the, the yeah you have harsh rule now the tazbu has aegis so it's oh so close to being enough here for the burgund if if they could have come up with any way on that draw step to pop aegis that would have won them the game or pick up a point of armor <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a lot it. of ways to do it. Now keep in mind, Tazbu is doing some damage, but the Bergen is, is not good at uh, getting in the last points. Yeah, it turns out there is actually a cost to playing with no pressure whatsoever in your deck. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in Genev Merchant Lethal Range, and it's possible Skycrake Synthesis... Um, if another spell gets played, could um, could get it over. Though, it, there's a chance, I think Gowser knows about one of these Sky Craig Synthesis, and we might see them um, try to take this game in a way where they don't make play a spell for the rest of the game. Right. But how can they best put on some pressure here? Because it's very challenging to play the Tazbu in hand at this point. I mean, Vine Grafter... Do whatever you want to do with Vine Grafter, and Molder Muck is a pretty strong... That's a lot of pressure. It doesn't put the other Tazbu into play. It doesn't involve playing a spell. So we're going to see first Valkyrie Enforcer, and Molder Muck, and Vine Grafter. Treasure Trove at the end of the sequence. Does Burgund Skycrack Synthesis? They do. Oh my goodness. Oh, Felon Adept. That does some blocking. Yep. And with a Defiance and a Skycrack Synthesis, they can probably get through to another turn. Do they have any method of triggering Frenzy? You're pumping a unit? Like. <laughs> oh, the top of my head. It's back, baby. Slay. Okay, well, I mean, this is going to get hit by synthesis, yeah. and this could really help. And the way that this has worked out, Gowser's doesn't necessarily get to use the rest of their power. Amber Accolade, not so much. We're not... I had a chump block. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't have to chump block. You can do this. Block there. Yeah, if if we can find a way to proc frenzy though, when your opponent's two, it's <laughs> pretty close to just doing being lethal on its own. Or give a little bit of strength. Yeah, we'll see an exploit here. Okay. If we see Pale Rider's timepiece played on like the new regen Vine Grafter, that would be good. But man, it's so risky. Oh, all right, we're gonna see Speaking Circle, or Combination, or in Combination is like so risky in all of this. Dark Bolt, so that would kill the Amber Acolyte, which would kind of on the table make it something lethal. Tragedy. But the, the short of this is, all of this is just, all the speaking circle is this turn is one spell. And that can yes. get tagged by the synthesis. Yes. And Gowser will be able to play Vine Grafter and go into the market, but they won't be able to do anything with it. So what was that? Was that Tragedy or Dark Bolt? 
it might be Dark Bolt. It's it's the cheaper of them, and you'd rather give your opponent a cheaper unit than a more expensive one. Temple Scribe. That's not a bad hit. It's not a bad hit, but it, you, you do have to wonder, does the Burgun need the hit to be, like, actually good? Like, actually game-winning, and I, I, that was not game-winning. Right. Because as much as this is all buying time, this is this is a tough board to come back against for the Burgund. And some of their methods, like Stormhall Plating and Sweepers, not really going to get it done quite yet. Genev Merchant, oh my gosh. Is there anything at all that deals damage? Yes, yes, there is. Savage Incursion. Well, that'll do lethal. Wow. I mean, that's just a fun one to just play. You just play very, very long games, and then your opponent has a lot of cards in the void. It's traditionally something you see as like a, uh, a discard payoff, but sometimes are very heavy, very controlling decks like to play with it because it just does a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's um, a rough one to get away if you're on the Argent board side. Definitely. That, that, uh, you're not, you're not going to, you know, the combination of, of draw and sort of some of the stumbles there, hard to get, you know, two more cracks at something like that, and uh, now really an uphill battle. Yeah, and, uh, you know, one of the things for the, that's gonna, the Bergen is going to benefit from this weekend is her control hasn't been one of the top decks in the ladder recently, and you're going to face against opponents who are, you know, there's no, it's not like anyone's going to be, like, confused when you play up against Defiance and Wisdom of Elders and the like. We've seen those cards many times over the years. But those turns when you have to decide how much you're going to commit, where do you put on your pressure, um, maybe something that the opponents weren't as familiar with this weekend. Yeah, and the, my experience has been against Huru Control that the speaking circle is, is quite strong. Um, against them? Yes, yeah. because they, they don't pressure sites all that well. And um, you do actually hit productive stuff some amount of the time, especially if you're tagging with units. And the, uh, uh, the end of it is their sweepers are turned off. All right, here we go. Exploit. Last game we saw Exploit mostly get foiled by face ages. This time it's going to break through early, and this looks like a pretty good one to hit Wisdom of the Elders. You don't have... It's tough for you to take this removal and actually unlock your units, but you could take their only piece of card advantage, and that is the way that Gowser's going to go. Yeah, you just can't let them start chaining together the wisdom into honor. You know, that's where, um, you know, it becomes really, really hard when you're factoring in all the cards you're, you're drawing that don't do anything. So, again, not the most intuitive thing, but I think it's the right, right call. So they, Gowser knows about the Defiance, which would cleanly answer the Reappropriator. So we'll see if they want to... Uh, run into it. They do, but the good news for Gauzer is that this second reappropriator could could do a lot. Now, or in condemnation will be an issue, of course. In general, though, I think if Gauzer can play a game where neither player is drawing a ton of cards, I like that a lot. Um, Especially with these Argent Port blueprints right now kind of being the most potent source of card advantage. Yeah, I mean, Gauzer can kind of grind too. Um, and, and the blueprints are a huge part of that. It's when both players have basically an unlimited number of resources, that's when uh, Gauzer can't hang. But if you can keep things in kind of the 6, 7, 8 power range, uh, Gauzer can play a deep game under those constraints. So look at this play by Burgon. They're going to go for Ice Bolt, my own unit. And we've seen this a couple times now. But with Valkyrie Enforcer, uh, the uh, second Archer Port Blueprints didn't get played. That, that means the Archer Port Construct doesn't have the seventh undepleted power to be cracked yet. I wonder what you would really be holding for. I guess there's a, is there a concern about... Um, no, not even Omen of Austerity doesn't really explain it, right? Cause yeah, the second way. copy is... Yeah, it'd be better for you to have a, the second construct down. Now, they drew Molder Muck, which does help things out. And right now, the Burgun doesn't have a sweeper, of course. I, right as I say that, we're going to hit a Fall the Spire. And the Burgun has a display of survival that could have transformed a construct. 
Gowser's going to go for popping the Construct first. They did pick up a Speaking Circle. So they can get back... What were their best units to get in an Aegis? Uh, re the, maybe just both the Reappropriators. Lighthoof, I guess, does some work against Speaking Circle. And Moldermuck... I mean, Moldermuck passes along the Aegis to the other units. That's interesting. So now for Gowser... We're going to see Moldermuck and Minotaur Lighthoof. <laughs> giving the, the Moldermuck unblockable. Sure. Display of Survival. Oh, look at that mode. We don't see that one every day. Deal five to each unit. Critically, that will kill both of those units. And now do you go back in with another crack at the Construct? When does the Speaking Circle come down? Feels like Gowser likes to establish their threats first before getting the Speaking Circle, but no, we're going to see. We'll see a little action here. Yeah, I, I, I like Speaking Circle on this turn. I mean, you just got to kind of get... This This puts such a burden on the Bergen to do something, and the units are just... Yes, they have Aegis. Yes, they're good if you get to your turn and all that. It's just unlikely to go that way. This is not a card that is easy for the Bergen to answer. Well, that was... Uh, so, Direwood him, Fantastic. Um, and that'll find another Speaking Circle. They got Touch of Resilience. That's a spell that can grant revenge to your units and spells. And then the last one was Fend Off, which certainly not as exciting as the others. That's just a simple little uh, stun a unit scout spell. So now we're going to see Arjunport Construct cracked once again. And yeah, this is a lot to work through um, for the Burgund. One option of how they want, could have played this game was they could have tried to use a display of survival on one of these relics. All right, boundless knowledge for them. That'll help refuel. Finds a Skycrag synthesis and a Stormout plating. That was just the first one. Ice Bolt and a Hailstorm. So lots of... Lots more action now for Burgund. Gowser is going to be leaning on the, the Queen of Glass here. Unfortunate that that Touch of Resilience didn't get played on a unit. That's a pretty good spell, but still a nice spot to be in having an Aegis Mulder Muck. So how can uh, Burgund sequence this now? They're going to start by Ice Bolting the Molder Muck. That'll get that one out of there. Then Boundless Knowledge. They did find a Defiance. So, but we are going to see the Queen of Glass. Now your units... Not, not, not especially killable while you have the Queen of Glass. We're going to see Speaking Circle number two. Now a Skycrag Synthesis did get picked up, so... Well, that spell went by fast. Do you happen to catch that one? Fire spell. Oh, no, no. Well, we'll see as they come out of the agenda here. Oh, I love the last one. That's, <laughs> that's an on me. That's a... Uh, that's a Dark Return that can give your units Exalted. Yeah, not a bad insurance policy to have in case something happens to the Queen of Glass. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of the removal, unfortunately, is sweepers, but looks like we are going to see that. Oh, Skycrag Synthesis. Nice when you hit a Decimate spell with that and grabs Hojin. Man, just so much cards to work with. This is the nice setup you ser Gowser has here. But feels like there's going to be a lot of answers to work through. Definitely. I actually think the Bergen, maybe this is not correct, but I, I thought that uh, play needed to be inscribed a while ago. Because at 25, you're not really looking at being close to lethal. And it's felt like the Bergen just needs all the power in the world to be able to play, you know, fend off everything, play multiple cards a turn, all that. Is this going to get hit by Skycrake Synthesis? The Bergen's going to have to carefully consider what's in the market because, you know, it was a D'Angelo bite. So this is going to be a much better one to hit. 
the question for Gowser is, do you play this right now? One of the things that's 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 just awkward is that you, you might also just get both of your units killed. You don't that that could be in the range. Yep. So attacking first with the Queen of Glass, and they did not play the D'Angelo Might in the second half of the turn when it couldn't get synthesized. Now they didn't know about it, but it's yeah, it's hard to play against all this stuff. Oh yeah, that's short of it. Stormwall plating, okay. Well, this feels like this could go okay for Gowser, because the second one could hit the Twisted Farmer. And then you would still have a nice big Aegis threat. You could D'Angelo might for three if you wanted to. Yeah. All right, amplifying. We got lots of mandrakes. If they ha if they have a spell in the agenda, if that's like a a rally, that would be pretty great. It was it was fire conjuring, Patrick. Beautiful. So we're looking at 12, 15, 18. I mean, it at least knocks out the plating, even if it's not lethal. And you're gonna get to draw four here. Five yeah. if you use the battlefront dasher first, but. If you want to just make the Battlefront Dasher an actual attacker. Well, keep in mind, you know, if Gowser wants to etchings out of the market, that has to come off of the farmer, too, so. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly a fine way to play it that to consider that, um, that Defiance is the most likely card, and that's the, the one you would want to hit the most. Yep. One thing also what you could do with Battlefront Dasher is next turn you could use that of the Queen of Glass. Hmm. So we're going to see draw five. Tazboo, not enough power for that there. Oh. Th th those weren't the most helpful, but we are going to get a big attack in, and Queen of Glass is going to be coming down. There's still a Battlefront Dasher, and you've got a couple of Tazboos on the way, so... This game's not over. No, not by a long shot. But this is pretty much going to empty out the board here. And the Bergen's armed with another combination to handle the Queen of Glass coming over the back. Boundless knowledge. Just uh, a, a lot of really good stuff kind of left over to uh, accrue some more cards and kind of handle the next wave. Yeah, there's Stormhold plating. So that's going to take out the Battlefront Dasher. Hit Gowser for six. This is another shields down moment um, for the Burgo. They do have base Aegis, but beyond that, no action. So does Gowser have something great they can get with this shadow etchings? I mean, what did we see last game? Regent's Tomb? Yeah, if, yeah, we have Not great here. No, you don't have a way to pop the Aegis. So double Tazbu. into the Regent's Tomb. Now, Burgun does have to do some work here. They're first going to have to transform. Then they can Harsh Roll. This is almost going to kill Gowser because yeah, they're going to take six. six. Yeah. So now we know from the previous game that if the Burgun can get into the market, that would be lethal. Right, Savage Incursion once again. So Gowser found Minotaur Light Hoof, so if they can successfully pop the player Aegis, they would be able to use the Light Hoof to finish it off. So what this game might come down to is the Regent's Tomb can provide the Sabotage. Skycrag Synthesis would negate that, but... It might not be obvious you would want to do that. Okay, so we're going to just see instead Twisted Farmers. Now, if Gowser... They need to play this very carefully. If they amplify too many times... Yeah, you would need to leave up enough where if your uh, Sapsuckers got Hailstorm, you would have enough to do it a second time. Right. And keep in mind, there's a little bit of a go-wide angle with Regent's Tomb. It does have Empower Units get plus one strength this turn. 
So now we'll see Hailstorm. And we will see another attack by... Stormhall Plating. The second Twisted Farmer is going to ambush. And now we'll see a Hailstorm finish those off. But this is all opening things up now. Power is down. Gowser can go... Regents Tomb Sabotage, Minotaur Light Hoof, or alternatively, they could go Light Hoof, Light Hoof Sabotage. And it looks like we're going to see that one instead. And this Sabotage will be a, a very, a very cr critical one because both taking Wisdom of Elders and Orin Condemnation both have a lot of upside here. Yeah, Wisdom of Elders is more of the churn and to keep just doing the same thing. Uh, if you take Condemnation here and uh, the Bergen bricks off the draws, it is just lethal. Right. But they are going to take Wisdom. They're going to get to go into the market. So they've gone a couple times now. Do they have a third card that is good in this matchup? They've got Eavesdrop. Don't mind that. I mean, it, the problem is, of course, we know about Skycrack's synthesis, but it's at least something to get. Yeah. Now, how aggressively will Bergen fire off the Skycrack synthesis? Because we're going to see either Lingering Influence or Swear Vengeance. It could promote prompt the Skycrack synthesis. It does not. So now Treasure Trove. Valkyrie Enforcer. Oh, Gowser, you might want to play a power. Unless, of course, you just don't want to give them the extra armor. I mean, it washes out the same. It does. Wash I guess. Out the I same. guess it's it's better against if the if it's two copies. And it washes, and over future turns, you'll have an extra power. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many of the turns we're gonna see here. Okay, honor claws off the top. Big, big turn here. Stormhall plating. Stormhall plating. That's a lot to work through, though. Keep in mind. Minotaur Lighthoof did pick up Revenge, so it could come back in a moment. But I think that will do it here as I don't believe... Oh, no, we could see a Warp Tazbu, but <laughs> Tazbu is not a good way to, uh, no, that comes to survive with a, at one. comes with its own problems. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see an eavesdrop for good measure from Gazer as the Bergen takes it down to nothing. Uh, Bergen uh, had a very easy time road of it with the with the Zenon deck last round. This one they really had to work through, and they uh, managed to navigate quite a quite a tricky set of threw, games. I mean, guys are through some really great punches there, and you can see that the the difference between Archerport and Zen in there, um, the the Twisted Farmer, which is not unique to Archerport, we saw in some of the Zen lists, but it's definitely more of a thing here. Uh, Tazbu, Regent's Tomb. Um, a little bit less removal. All that stuff kind of added up into the matchup being competitive. And, I mean, both games felt like uh, it was very, very close that uh, Gowser could have won. I thought that trying to focus the discard on taking the card drawing and try to make each player play from, like, kind of the same base of cards was the right thing to do tactically. Um, but it's very hard to stop the top of the deck with that little with, without having that much pressure. And eventually, you know, card drawing, strung together card drawing, Found the last few points of damage. All right. So that's going to do it for the semifinals. We'll be back with the finals of this Open in just a few minutes, and we'll be crowning a champion and sending one of these players on to our world championships. So I have a one other thing. It's, it's more of a... How, how would I say, like a south question, <laughs> just on my part, because uh, this is the reason that I actually quit the competitive eternal some time ago. I just came back for this tournament, actually. Like it was my first tournament after a long, long period of not playing in tournaments, because uh, I think I was quite unlucky in some tournaments. It was still the era of like qualification games that you had to play 28 games. Mm -hmm. And during two of my last runs, I was seven times out of 28 games on the play. So I got to start seven games each time. So it's like, what, 
25%. So I was thinking that this is super unlucky playing aggressive decks and I don't get to start. And my victory percentage on the play was by a big margin, like better than on the draw. So I was feeling like, would it be possible to make it so that in this kind of stuff that it would kind of be at least close to 50-50 about the games that you start and not start? Or is this like, you just want to be, want it to be random like it is in real life? Yeah, so you're, you're sort of asking, could we make it um, so that way players could more often within a small sample um, would be 50-50 with play draw? Uh, yeah. yeah, it, I, it's not, I'm sure that there would be a way to do that. Um, the idea of that there being, it being stronger or better to go first than second in games is something that we, um, that we pay attention to as we're designing on cards, testing formats, uh, thinking things. And it's something we keep an eye on because we can certainly understand that um, it being sort of an element or a facet of the game that is out of your control more than most, um, why that would be, why that would be meaningful. And um, the end of the day, we are comfortable that the, that with the win percentages um, being close enough to 50, yeah. 50, that, um, that, that it's not a, something that is determining your results. Um, uh, certainly it's something that we try to, and we can understand that it is a skill testing thing for players to be able to manage uh, the play, being on the player that draw and uh, adjusting their game plans now. And a heavy imbalance is something that uh, would certainly be frustrating. I can understand that if you feel like your deck is particularly well suited to being on the play. And I think uh, something that will be, you know, we, we want to keep making cards that work um, better if you're on the play, work better if you're on the draw. and um, that sort of thing. And one of the things that we looked to change was um, with the opens for this year was the idea of you getting two shots to qualify because, you know, whether it's play draw or, you know, your, your opponents having particularly strong draws or your deck not coming together, or you just making a careless mistake, um, we kind of thought it'd be cool if you could not have that completely uh, tank your chances uh, overall for the tournament. And, you know, we have best of three for the Sunday portion, but for the qualifying runs, breaking it up into two chances would give you um, a shot, even if something kind of went catastrophically went, went wrong in one of your runs. Yeah, I do like this new system a bit more than the old one. But yeah. Well, and it was, it was more of the, like a, not a real question like I'm okay with this and uh, I've just been keeping track of my games like lately like past 900 games or something and it has been helping me with this thing like thinking that I'm really unlucky but the truth is that I'm unlucky but not that unlucky that I felt well, that is, that's part of the nature of uh, playing in games with variants is exactly. we all have those uh, confirmation biases and of remembering the times when things rolled against us. Um, I, did you, I'm curious, do you, do you recall how often you got to be on the play in the, the draft open with the Skycrag aggro deck? Uh, so because it's the, only the first game is like random and mm -hmm. then the loser. So during the top 64, I was two times on the play, four times on the draw. And every round I went two and zero, except for the final. It was my first game loss in the final game one. And I was on the draw there also. <laughs> wow, I didn't and also realize during that. The, That's... During okay. the qualification, I was also, uh, I had the buy, so it was 13 games. I was five times on the play eight times on the draw yeah so you went so before the finals you had won game one every with your with your deck on the draw 
every time. I mean, you said you hadn't lost yes. the game, so I guess that's yeah. definitely true. That's <laughs> yeah, very nice. But I had a feeling that I got a bit of help from my opponents during those games, like um, not from them, but their decks. Like I think at least my round one and round two opponents had some problems with the colors, like they didn't find their third color. And uh, I think my round three opponent was flooded like really badly. And yeah, so I got bit lucky in those game ones, but. Well, you managed to draft a lean, mean fighting machine and yeah. uh, it certainly paid off. Yeah, it's, you know, there's, um, yeah, I, I will say that just like it's a challenge for players, uh, it's a challenge for designers. Um, those sorts of like issues of not finding the third faction and draft is something that it will be frustrating when it happens to you in your games and for us as designers, we try to make a range of tools and cards available to you in the format that can help you in that area if you want to. Um, but we also make, you know, multi-faction cards that might make it even extra enticing to splash and uh, navigating that challenge of consistency versus power um, is, is the kind of challenge that it's an it's kind of an unsolvable problem, and those are oftentimes the most fun problems to work on. Yeah, I can I can see that, and I couldn't imagine being like uh, what you are doing. <laughs> That's you just uh, a lot of it. A lot you just you 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 gotta try stuff. Um, just like you know you you had to lose a lot of games before you won and made it to world championships. Uh, um, we make a lot of uh, bad cards that we throw out every day before we make the ones that uh, get to you all. That's good to know. <laughs> all right, uh, Jan, any, any uh, last thoughts, anything you want to say? Is there a place where people can reach you if you want, if you want them to? Um, anything like that? Uh, I'm more of a person who doesn't like publicity so much. Like... Uh, this was uh, already kind of anxious to be part of this, but I'm, I'm good sports for that. And I did get some practice, like I wanted to thank a podcast called Farming Eternal. Like their co-host contacted me after the win to be part of the podcast. So I want to give something back to them, them and also I can, how do you say? I lost four words. I can say that it's a good podcast, in my opinion, and you should try it out if you are interested in Eternal Draft. That's great. All right. So check out that podcast, Farming Eternal. And thanks so much for joining us. You did a great job. And uh, the Eternal community, I know, always loves to just get to know better some of these players and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to be interested to hear, hear your journey. Uh, you've, you're doing great work, it sounds like, over in Finland. And appreciate you and uh, look forward to seeing you in the World Championship. So thanks so much for joining us, Jan. I'm going to throw it back to myself in the booth now as we get back into things in the open. Thanks. See you in the world. All right, welcome back to the Open. And for our finals today, we have the Burgund versus Alex Fierro. It's going to be a creation versus Hoover control matchup. And uh, the Burgund, you know, we haven't seen, as mentioned, uh, Hoover control late in the event in a while, but it's back. And uh, the Burgund is going to sh see if it can deal with the the new sort of the new upstart, the new hotness in the streets in the creation project. We've seen the Burgund play a couple of times so far, but I don't believe we've seen this matchup yet. We've seen them up against some more of these like shadow mid-range control decks, and now we're going to get to see how they can hold up against um, against the creation project. And so, you know, for tools to deal with that card directly, they've got Display of Survival, which can transform relics. They've got Vision of Austerity in the in the market, and so that not only deals with the first creation project, but it can lock out the additional ones. Now, 
you can always blow up the omen of austerity, maybe re-unlock it. And then in general, I would say that we're going to see um, the Bergen try to get to a part of the game where they're able to do things like, hey, sweep the board and draw more cards in the same turn and just keep keep them at bay that way. And let's, uh, let's get it going here now. Alex Fierro, bottom of your screen on creation aggro up against a Huru control deck. They got two sweepers, Hailstorm and Harsh Roll. No relics to speak of for Alex Fierro, and that's not what you want to see. Stand together, though. An absolutely phenomenal card against control, as always. Yeah, you got to get a little bit of a board going first before it'll do a lot of work. But uh, if you get ahead, that could be the, the last piece of the puzzle there. All right, so display of survival for the bird gun now. For Alex Fierro, it's they gotta they're gonna need to sequence very carefully. They don't want to get lose too many cards to one spell, and with flexible cards like pause for reflection and stand together in hand, the timing is gonna matter a lot. But we're gonna kick things off with an abundance here. That's gonna make a one drop and buff up Alessi. We got a gloaming wisp making mm. nightfall on the enemy player's turn. Uh, yeah. Very Don't nice. mind that. No? Spiteful Lumen! Give one of your wisps deadly! <laughs> Just the synergies that are unlocking here yeah, are pretty, it's incredible. pretty incredible. And Nightfall is something you don't really mind for Alex because you're, you're just going to be going so much uh, cheaper than the Burgun that them getting an extra card is not nearly as good as you. Alright, it's all coming through right now. Pause for reflection. Ice Bolt is going to hit that, and we're going to see, yeah, pause for reflection, pick the Alessi back up. Alex Fierro still gets the power from the Ice Bolt. That'll come in handy. And we're going to see Hailstorm sweep away these two units, but, you know, with a couple more units in hand and a stand together, liking how things are shaping up early for Alex. Yeah, pretty good start. Has, has gotten some pressure. Card flows come in. Stand together is is close to being you know um, online and potent. All right, so for the Burgun, they've managed to uh, to kind of keep the board relatively empty so far. Now we're getting into the mid game. We see Desert Marshal, and uh, the Burgun's going to put them to the test with an attack here. Now Alex can start just throwing out some units. And uh, holding up stand together. I will mention that against this particular build of Huru, you, you got to watch out for those Skycrake synthesis because getting those hit by uh, one of those hitting a stand together could be a game breaking move. But we will see stand together working right now. Oh, no, it's going to be another pause for reflection, of course. Ice Bolt now gets through Aegis, and so these pause for reflections are just working really nicely. Yeah, it's a uh, um, a way of holding up stand together while protecting a unit. So every game so far, we've seen the Bergen go for Helio first, but this time it's going to be Vision of Austerity, really trying to keep themselves uh, away from having to deal with any relics. Now, D Dinosaur Nest is a relic that can get hit by it, but how much is that one marked for just the creation project? We'll see. So we see a power burst played by Alex Fierro. Both buffs up the Alessi and allows Alex to have access to pause for reflection and stand together in the same turn. Does kind of put the hand up on the table, though. That it does. <sighs> so now here we see Harsh Rule... But a stand together is going to keep around everything for Alex Fierro. And the Bergen's going to drop game number one here. So it was very nicely done by Alex. Um, they had a lot of windows where they could have played stand together. And I, I think that might have actually thrown the Bergen for a bit of a loop. Like, I, I don't think I would have been playing that game on the other side of the table and thought, you know what, this feels like a game where my opponent has stand together. And I really like the, you know, not committing it to it until 
the harsh rule uh, shows up. Um, you can tell there that Alex has a lot of ways to sort of get, you know, four to six uh, attack onto the table. Push, push, push. You can sort of fire back against individual removal spells with your own tricks. Uh, at a certain point, the game is going to come down to whether or not the Birkin can get a harsh rule effect to stick. And if you have to stand together then, uh, then that's going to do it as we saw in that game. And a really big difference was the use of pause for reflection by Alex Fierro. You know, we've seen this Haru control deck go up against other uh, decks where the unit interaction was a, such a liability um, because it didn't do anything. It's a Haru deck. Pause for reflection. You're not going to permanently kill the thing when you when you use it on an enemy's uh, unit or relic. But the big advantage it has is that you get to um, use it in very creative ways against control decks uh, to potentially protect and bring back one of your own things. Now we'll see for the Burgund in game number two. They've got kind of what you'd be looking for. Some card draw, some sweepers, some spot removal and ice bolt. The one thing they didn't have was a way to deal with relics, but they can do that now if they want to display a survival of the dinosaur nest. They're not going to, though. Um, still probably just trying to hit a creation project with it is, is the bet here. Yeah, now there's this interesting question of do you believe that display of survival could be sandbagged here. Yeah, the, the, the leveling games have been great so far. Now, the second copy of Creation Project obviously gives a good amount of incentive, but we're going to see that Relic get hit. Now the Burgund is going to try to gas their hand back up. Honor of Claws. They hit another Sweeper and the Boundless Knowledge. But Alex Fierro's got a second copy of the Creation Project, and that one is a real lot for a control deck to deal with is every turn it's going to come pretty close to giving Alex just an extra draw. Now Fall the Spire is quite nice because if the, the card on top of the deck is a warp unit or it's something that's already in your void you can't even warp it. Not a consideration at this point but perhaps down the road we'll see a little bit of it. But that was a great setup there for Alex because uh, the Bergen has to choose between either getting rid of the creation project or sweeping you. In either way, you're either coming back with a bunch of units or you're gassing back up. There's a Rallying Supplier. Draw two more. And now we'll see for the Burgund a Boundless Knowledge. They found a s couple of Stormhall platings, but do they need to make their power drop? They are, so they're going to inscribe and gain two armor. And this is where things really get hard for the Burgund because they, they'd really like to be kind of getting to that point of the game where they've already played a couple of card draw spells. They've swept a couple of times, and they would really hope that their opponent would be close to running out of action. But that's just not the way that things are really going to go when you're up against the Creation Project. Yeah, the Burgund, you're gonna, I would describe it as is getting leaned on right now. There's enough pressure that they're sort of compelled to respond, but enough card advantage where... If all you're doing is sweeping, then uh, Alex can just keep gassing back up. All right, so a Genev Merchant found by the Burgund offers some promise there. And yeah, we're seeing the buff from the Creation Project really come up. It's, it's you know, just making it so there's a lot of damage coming across. I think the Burgund's did a nice bolt there. I think they've kind of settled on. This is going to be a turn where we're going to see a sweeper get played. And it, Luckily, it gets to be Hailstorm, and so that's going to maybe open things up for a Genev Merchant to... Or rather, uh, a Genev Merchant to also get played this turn. We're going to see Ice Bolt get played in response to a pause for reflection, and now we're going to see a Fearless Crescendo to get played on another unit. So all sorts of things happening. Edict of Grodov is now going to be able to bounce this spell if they want to? Oh, I mean, they could do it to the... Uh, the ha they could just put the Hailstorm oh, on yeah, too, right? Oh, yeah, the, the Hailstorm just goes right to the bottom. So this is going to mean we're going to have another seven coming across. There's another creation project and a stand together. Not bad. No, it's certainly not. This... Could certainly provoke another ice bolt here. I, mean, I think if you're Alex, though, you could just make this attack first. Right. You can just sit. 
And you know your opponent's running a hailstorm, that doesn't matter. Now everything's up to four. Oh, I think that hailstorm's just on bottom. All right, so, okay, well this... So they're gonna ice bolt right away. So now one of these is lethal. They would need to have something they can get that interacts for one. The Bergen doesn't have it. They could have got Hailstorm Geneva Merchant if there's maybe a permafrost that can work them through it, but probably wasn't there in the market this weekend. So Alex Fierro takes it down, and so uh, you know we 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 kind of went all around this uh, a little bit of full circle almost this weekend in this tournament. You know, Creation Project obviously the big deck coming in started off a little slow didn't see it doing too much winning really saw zen and shine and then we get to the later stages the bergen with their Huru control deck just knocking out these mid-range decks trying to prey on the creation project decks and then at the end of the day it was the creation project that was successful first tournament in and it gets a win so we'll see how the metagame can adapt here and what new tools players picked up from this weekend uh but uh a fun event all around, and we want to thank all of you for joining us. Patrick, any closing thoughts before we put a book pin on this one? What was really cool about this, or there were two things. One is just who were control, great metagame call, not a deck that people were really anticipating. Great run by the Burden. Unfortunately, you know, ran into a, a player who played the matchup very, very well at the end there with stand together in their deck. About as good as a, of a matchup as you could really ask for there in the finals. And then uh, both with the Creation Project and the builds of Zenin, we saw this over and over again of just there's more cards available than you can play. And so stuff like are you playing Sandstorm Titan or not? Are you playing Stand Together in your market or is it a card that you're playing along the deck? Um, that informs a lot of these matchups. And so even if the metagame now is kind of defined by these pillars, there are subsets within those decks. These are not stock lists and I expect there to be more kind of iteration on these things as, as time goes. Because we see Stand Together in the winning list. Do you want Stand Together against Zenin? Not really. The game's about brawl and with, you know, their five fives and six sixes stand together and not that much removal. Stand together doesn't really play. And so I think players can take this and we can see that kind of cycle go up from there. And maybe someone can decide, find, discover something that can at least be good against two of the three things that we saw in heavy rotation here. And um, excited to sort of see the throw and metagame uh, adapt and evolve after this tournament. All right. So we'll see. We'll be back next month with another open. We got an expedition open and. Looking forward to seeing you there at September 23rd to the 24th. And, uh, may, you know, if you hit Masters in any of our formats uh, this month or next month, you'll get uh, an extra buy to start off on, on your open runs, and that'll get you one step closer to qualifying. I want to thank our producer, Tom, and Patrick for joining me this weekend, Tim and the entire Phoenix uh, production team for helping put this event together. Um, a lot of fun as always hanging out with you folks and thanks to our players for joining us. We couldn't do this uh, if you were playing or watching at home. And once again, congratulations to Alex Fierro. We'll see them at the World Championships. Until next month, signing off here from Direwolf Digital.